Thank you for that, Laura. Um, Martha, it's good to have you back in Champaign. Thank you so much. Uh, by way of introduction, I uh, had asked Martha for some, uh, for some details to share with all of you. And in, in true Ag Tools form, it's a mountain of data. So I picked out a few things that I thought were particularly exciting. So Martha has almost 30 years of experience in the worldwide IT, telecommunications, food and agriculture, and supply chain. She's also served on the board of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. It, as much as it pains me to admit, they do know a thing or two about growing food. I'm from <laughs> Illinois, so it's a little bit of a tricky thing to admit, but it's true. You need lettuce. Um, yeah, it's true. We do need lettuce. Um, Martha has also served on the board of the uh, ed editorial board of the Institute of Food Technologists, the Worldwide Advisory Board of Women for Walmart, and the Executive Board of the United States Hispanic Chambers of Commerce. Um, like Laura mentioned, uh, Martha currently serves as the CEO of AgTools, um, where she and her brothers won the Microsoft Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence Award. AgTools covers 500 commodities, 29 years of historical data, more than 3 billion data points, and over 50 years of weather patterns worldwide. And I think you process how many billion transactions per second? A billion transactions per second. One billion transactions per second. So really exciting to have your insight on supply chain, I think. Coming out of the pandemic, um, which hopefully we are doing now, um, I think we've seen, uh, particularly across the food supply chain, uh, what was already a stressed ecosystem three years ago has, has now started to show s several stress fractures around where, uh, where, where that supply chain has been fragile. So I would love to get your thoughts, especially with some recent things we've talked about, the, the, the issue with avocados and the many factors that, are, that, that affect that viability, kind of what, what your perspectives are on the most significant pain points uh, facing uh, food supply chain. I, I, good morning. Um, I think supply chain has never been out of stress, has always been on a stressful um, thin rope, and I have seen it throughout my years of careers around the, the world. Uh, it was always that minute there was something going to break, and it would break, but few of us in the United States would notice it because somehow it got delivered. But we had a lot of things, and I remember one, Apartheid South Africa could be one example, and that was a stressful for the agricultural industry, believe it or not. And so we are walking out of uh, COVID-19, but we're walking into a war, and we have to remember that um, Ukraine has 25% of the um, dark soil um, in the world, and it was bumping up to be one of the leading farming regions for that world, that part of the world, and so now everything is going to shift again. And so you're going to start seeing new players in many commodities, whether it's sunflower, whether it's blueberries, whether it's uh, soy or corn. So, so it is an ongoing issue. I think that it's going to take us at least five to ten more years before everybody realizes that it is not a just one issue. It's many issues that the supply chains are continuously stressed out. So when you think about through the various layers of supply chain, and just to kind of enumerate a few starting with the one that we're probably all most familiar with at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So every time I pick up an avocado or a tomato or a head of lettuce, um, there's obviously many miles that it's, that it's traveled most likely to get there. Um, and so as you kind of think about from where it comes to me at a grocery store, from where it was produced out of the ground, what, what are some of the challenges with the handoff from each of the players and, and maybe help us understand a little bit who the players even are to, to to bring something like fresh produce to a grocery store? Well, interesting enough, I, I remember being on a meeting with us, our Secretary of Agriculture today. I, I, by that time, he still was retired. Uh, well, not retired, he was working with a company. And I mentioned to the audience that sustainability in this country means completely different than many other countries. And he grasped on this and said, yeah, there's a whole different world out there that, is, that means sustainability. And we just saw it with avocados. Um, and I mentioned it that day, three years ago, I talked about drug dealers. And people kind of knew, but didn't know. Well, the avocados were stopped, uh, the shipments of avocados were stopped three, four weeks ago by the Department of Agriculture because um, the threat of USD inspectors in Mexico. And that is sustainability, that means somebody has to continuously survive in our countries, on many countries overseas, to deliver to the main uh, developed countries. 
So that's just one area to show you that, how is it that a whole industry stops because of a threat. Uh, they negotiated for five days, literally embassies to embassies, Secretary of Agriculture and even the presidents got involved because we needed our avocados at the supermarket for our toast. Uh, <laughs> in the meantime, what very few people know is that our countries have been plagued by these, uh, unfortunately, is, is, is citizens not desiring our countries who charge every single shipper, every single farmer, extra quota to even pro produce. So that is one of the issues that you have to think when you're doing supply chain around the world, even on the inbound or the outbound will always be. So that's one uh, extreme one. Another one could be exchange rate. Uh, very few people understand the exchange rate movements in our industry uh, because we come heavily from the raw crops industry, but as we start moving into this more agile in world, it's going to start impacting us more faster across. And I, I can start seeing it, I'm seeing it. I uh, have dealt with the raw crops from uh, the overseas side of it, and I starting to see that all these little elements, we call it the 76 variables, are going to start impacting each one and every farmer across the world. So, so one of the things that I think has come to my attention in, in particular most recently, but I'm sure several people have been sensitive to for a long time, is the availability of labor in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so what insights do you have on kind of how, on sort of how that uh, challenge has, has emerged, kind of uh, ways that it's being mitigated and, 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 and other insights you might, you might have on that? The, the, this is going to be the biggest challenge. Um, and it's not just in USA, it's worldwide. Um, Philippines, I'm going to give you one simple example. Philippines is the largest producer of pineapples for the, after Costa Rica, between Costa Rica and Philippines. And I was testing it, tasting it today. I love my pineapples. Um, and um, kids are leaving the farms, no matter which country. They just don't want to work. It's too hard. It's, it's, it's a tough industry. And so the, the robotics, uh, are we going to match faster robotic against the, supply, the need of supply of labor? I'm not sure. I'll give you one example in my country. I'm from Colombia origin. Uh, our workers used to be our workers. Now our workers are Venezuelan immigrants who had to immigrate who had to leave the country, over three million of them left the last couple, of three, four, five years. And now the workers in Colombia happen to be Venezuelans in the coffee farms. So it tends to be the migrant, the migrant uh, immigrants tend to be the workers in the farms. But is that sustainable? Because that father who came doesn't want the kid to stay there. They want to move it out. And I have a couple good uh, stories. One, uh, several of my Hispanic friends who actually were kids of farm workers. Um, the, the parent did everything possible to get him out of the farm or her out of the farm. And they remember how beautiful, and they, I talked to them today, they're 50 or 60s and they say, I wish I would have never left. But it was too late, the parents pushed him out because they thought it was hard. So if just how, to, how do we train the young generation to think different about farming? And not only technology wise, but sustainability of our earth and our food supply chain. So, so when challenges like this come up, I mean, I, I, there are some things that are really hard to predict. I think we've witnessed two of them in the last mm -hmm. three or four years. But some things, like the, the changes in labor patterns are perhaps a little bit easier to predict. What makes it challenging for supply chain uh, professionals throughout the various, you know, throughout, that, uh, throughout the supply chain to identify quickly and respond to threats that are predictable, but then also some of the ones that are unpredictable. What, what makes that challenging? COVID-19 was not unpredictable. It was going to happen. We knew it because we had a, a virus before. And it was challenging for us, some of us who were on the ground already. Um, so we, it was not it was going to happen, it was when it was going to happen. What we, are, what we do is like what we do in our homes. We just are relaxed, we have a roof, we don't have to worry too much, we don't have to do maintenance. But you do have to do maintenance. I mean, how is it that the Port of California, the, the, the Long Beach or LA Port, is, it's, it's overwhelmed, it cannot receive anymore. That, that has been an ongoing thing for the last 15, 20 years, I've been part of that. But it exaggerated now, it happened to be shown all over the place now, and now there's money. Pour in. 
And now there's automatization that's going to happen. It's going to take 10 years, so we're going to suffer for a while. So everything that happens, has a, there have signs. Um, they mentioned today there's signs that when he was driving in China and he, something happened to mass letter, he figured out. Same thing happens in this industry. And today I was giving a talk um, in, in overseas, and the signs are there. If you, I, I used to collect um, uh, newspaper clips and file them to make sure that I understand uh, when I used to ship, for example, a vessel of banana from Ecuador to St. Petersburg every week. I would collect the newspaper tr uh, uh, clips from Panama, from Russia, from Ecuador, from uh, many countries, and divide them by segments because that would give me the signs of what could have happened. So the signs are always there. It's just that we human beings tend to relax a little bit too much. We don't, I don't think we can afford it anymore. And the good news is that technology is here to help us do this faster. Hopefully at a billion transactions per second. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think maybe then if you had to kind of project the challenges that we aren't paying attention to, I think most of us probably have thought more about where our food comes from in the last couple of years than we had before. But are there, what are, do you think that there are still some things that maybe aren't getting the attention that they should? And, and what would those things be? I would say 10, 15 years ago, I remember working with uh, the company you mentioned earlier, with W, about local sourcing. Local sourcing should be a growth area and must be. That's the zero mile. Uh, the good news that we're starting to build these units in, even in the Midwest, where you can get better lettuce, and I joke about it, but it is true. Um, there are a lot of good fruits and vegetables that you still can grow locally, and that, and this, our grandparents used to do it. They, they had peaches only two months of the year. They had lettuce only so many months of the year. Um, think about this. The peaches, now you go to, a, to the store and you have peaches year round, right? But they don't taste as good as when Georgia and the southern states produced those where there were like three months of the year that were like super delicious. We have made that availability year round lose our taste buds. So now when the real Georgia <laughs> peaches come out, there's not much demand because we have peaches in November which are coming from overseas that have no flavor. So the changing of the buds, and that's why I sit on the international food technologies because food is related to what we grow, and uh, like the corn uh, oil, so same thing. Uh, we, have to be, um, we have to be aware of growing more locally and starting to take a stand more on, on growing locally and eating locally only the times of the year that we have. And, and that will push back up, it will push up uh, buyers to realize that. And I remember the project they were trying to do, but the consumers were not buying into it. I think that we're ready now, and young generations are ready for that. So how much of that is a behavioral shift from the customer to demand locally grown produce, and how much of that is a sort of an economic calculus on whether or not it can be profitable, whether or not it can be profitable at scale? How much of that do you think uh, the consumer can influence versus uh, a, a shift in the economic model? Well, one of our customers buys for the military basis, and he uses our data. He knows that there's mangoes in Florida. He just doesn't know when because he's, he's every day he wakes up at 4 and he runs, 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 and he just makes sure that trucks are coming in and the commissaries are filled in. But when he got the data, and not because it's our data, but just in general, I always have been about local sourcing, um, he looked into the fact that there are eight weeks of the month mangoes from Florida. So he calls his shipper who sells him mangoes and says, hey, I want those eight weeks of the year mangoes from Florida for two reasons. One, number one, personal for him, I'm helping my farmers locally. But number two, because the flavor is much better. Anything that comes from overseas, every mango that comes from overseas is thrown into these huge heated waters that takes away all the sugar. Of the of the tomato of the of the mango, and what you're eating here is like one tenth of the flavor of a mango, because they need to take out the larva. And I have developed those those plants overseas, while the local Florida mango is so tasty and so delicious. But guess what? The consumer said, "Ooh, this is so sweet." Again, the adjustment of the uh, buds. But uh, he already told his supplier, "Every year I want my mangoes." those weeks from Florida. So it's, it's also, it, it, buyers do understand, uh, and they want to, 
they want to impact our communities. So, so how, do, how would you suggest increasing the transparency of when the best time to buy a vegetable is? How do, how do we get more of that information in front of, in front of consumers? We could and we should and we will. Uh, it's, going to be, it's going to take a little bit of time, but it's going to take uh, buyers uh, to keep... Right now, buyers are very concerned about food safety and obviously food supply. Uh, but it's up to us consumers to start demanding to see where things come from. Um, uh, one, uh, one of my team members brings a story of a person who um, sells these sweaters that are tied to the, 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 the ship that is in Australia or New Zealand, and they can see this, now they can track that ship for the rest of their lives, and then they can even buy more sweaters from that ship. I don't know whether it's profitable or not, but it sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Maybe it's a very much of a, of a boutique thinking, but still, you start growing and you start, that's how you plant the seed, literally, and so hopefully that will keep growing, and I want to know who and what is grown and where it's grown. M more important, because part of our food waste, which happens yes, between farms and distribution centers, we lose um, over 4,900 truckloads per day, literally, that were farmed, ready to go, ready to be eaten, we throw them in the trash. Uh, worldwide are 62,900, more or less. Well, what we also know is what we throw in the refrigerator. But it has to do with that traveling time, too. So hopefully we'll get there, hopefully in the next couple, uh, one decade or so, because technology is speeding it up faster. So uh, kind of shifting gears a little bit, we've talked about how produce can flow from a farm to a grocery store and some of the logistical challenges. But associated with that, I think one of the other things that people are paying more attention to is the data that follows that particular piece of produce or, or a truckload of produce or something like that. Can you help us understand how, to the extent that it does, how data flows from the producer, the, the grower, all the way through to the grocery store Yes, uh, there was a mention about uh, um, our beer gentleman that um, the farmers, they, that now we want to have more data and then we're looking at more data and where things are coming from. And the reality is that I remember when uh, he was talking about that nobody believed in climate change and now they see the climate change. Same thing happened to me. I would say 12 years ago we were preparing to ship peaches and plums and stone fruit. And you just pass them on, clean them, and put them in a the box. And they said, no, you have to start putting the sticker. And they said, no way. There's, nobody can put a sticker like that. No, no, no. We have to start putting the sticker. And a lot of pushback by farmers uh, because it was a unit that they had to buy now to put the sticker. Look at it. Now every single lemon or any unit has a sticker. Uh, and now they have no choice because you have to trace back for food safety originally, but now because the consumer is saying, I want to know where this comes from. So we're starting to be able to do that. N not 100%, but um, the strawberry industry already has pushed for that. And so your UPC or your code will track back where it's coming from. So you're starting to be more engaged. And I think that's going to be good for all of us consumers to see, because we have been so disconnected of where the food comes from that it comes from. And, and I, when I say food, it's not just food. I always mention that everything comes from nature. Even our uh, Tesla has lithium, which is from nature. Uh, everything comes from nature and everything gets impacted. So we, we want to trace back everything. And where is that lithium coming from? Oh, yes, somewhere in Africa where kids have to do this without feet, without the shoes, and they have to dig through the mud to pull out that element so we can drive our Tesla. Well. Are we starting, uh, kids are starting to wonder about this too, right? So it's, it's going to happen. So when you, when you think about the information that resides on a farm that would be useful to either a, a, a grocery marketer or a logistics, uh, a, a logistics coordinator or a shipper, what information is still kind of siloed in these various handoffs where you, you get mm -hmm. the... You get the bushel of tomatoes, but you don't get information about either when it was harvested or some other piece of information that would be... Or what goes into the tomato, or what's on the ground. Right. Because at the end of the day, uh, this whole GMO uh, was an issue that I had to sit on the board to go through the whole process in California. And as you know, California gets a little bit uh, trendy and leader in many things that then the country adopt. Uh, sometimes not. 
Um, but what happened is that we are starting to understand that what goes in that soy, corn, tomato, I don't care where, now we're starting to wonder because at the end of the day, we remember now that our grandmothers used to know what to eat properly to be healthier. And then we went into this whole phase of forgetting that. Now we're starting to go back into it. So I have even uh, farmers that have quinoa, for example, in um, California and somewhere in Wisconsin that are starting to plant quinoa with certain type of seeds that are in certain native regions that are the environment is properly for that so they don't have to put so many chemicals. It's not because about being organic. It's let's, let's eat what is natural to that region and not what is not. And I mentioned that because coming from coffee farms, um, there's no way you can change the environment of the Colombian coffee region or the Brazilian or the Ethiopian. Those you can change. That, that coffee will behave completely different, like obviously the corn and the soy and all that. But having lived it with my grandpa, that's really what it is. It's unique. So we ha we're going back to that, and I see that starting to happen much more. So I think we're, we're going to leave some time for questions. Um, so uh, while uh, the microphone kind of circulates, I'll ask one more around the value to the producer and other people where tracking this data is an additional effort. So is there value in, uh, in that data? Do you think that in some way an in-consumer or, or a wholesaler <laughs> sees value in, in only buying from people who can provide the volume of data that they need to, to run efficiently? I think that the, the biggest change that is happening in the next five to 10, 15 years is not data, is not technology, is our brains. Um, we, I myself didn't used to order an Uber in my whole life and now I do it in two seconds, right? The brain has trained itself to be able to work with a phone for an Uber. I used to pick up the phone and call my taxi guy and stand in the front of the door to wait for my taxi, not anymore. That I think is the change and we're seeing it in the farmers, um, the pushback on data originally because it was too much or it's too much. Why? Because I, I will still, as until I die, will say that the farmer is an artist. The farmer takes that canvas, which is the ground, and makes a beautiful crop or paints a beautiful crop. Well, to focus on that, that's one brain. The other brain, the data brain, is numbers, and that's not what he or she is trained to. Um, and so how do we start adjusting those brains backwards? And uh, you did mention at the beginning, but I'm a cartoonist, right? So the, the brain of creative and the brain of numbers have to continuously start mixing from here on. And we're starting to see more leaders that play the guitar, <laughs> that, do, that, that do technology. So we're starting to accept the fact that the creativity which was mentioned earlier, and the business world is starting to work much closer. And I think that's, that will c help the brain evolve for us to grab data for either the consumer to know where your product comes in two seconds or for the farmer to be able to understand what he or she needs to do in order to make it business profitable or uh, make a better decision for the consumer. Thank you. Yeah, so I have a quick question. Uh, I'm Sandy Delarba, professor here at the university. Uh, thank you so much, Jack and Martha, for your insights. I have a question related to the fact that climate change is obviously a very big disruption into the food supply chain, right? So I wanted to hear from you, Martha, if you could give us some insights with respect to how do companies actually get prepared for it, in a sense that now places where crops are being grown might shift, right, 50 years from now which also means that transportation cost might in some cases increase, in some cases decrease compared to what we are looking at now. Uh, at the same time, new technologies are coming up. Um, for instance, in engineering here, they're thinking about trucks that will move without a driver, a bit, a bit like the Tesla car you're discussing. So could you give us some insights as to how they foresee what's coming up in 30, 50 years from now? So uh, I wish I could, and I will one day, I hope, <laughs> but not today, but I'll tell you what has happened. When I used to develop crops in the past, even when I was doing the, the soy program in Brazil, I could plan 10 years in advance. Literally, I would plan the, the, the whole program and plan 10 years in advance, and, and the whole financials would look like that. Banana programs, I don't care. It was always really in advance. 
Um, and I always had what we call plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D. Plan A, it never worked, because obviously the first shipments never work very perfectly, and there's a lot of hoopas happening, and then you figure it out. Plan B, hopefully you figure it out, and it's starting to go smooth, but maybe not, didn't write completely, didn't understand everything that you had to go through, and you will, again, lose some money on, on, on level B. But level C, now you're really losing money if you haven't figured it out. And if you had to go to plan D, you might as well shut down, right? That, you do it in three to five years in the past, 10 years, not anymore. You literally, literally have to do it by months now. And even when I had to do a processing plan for oranges in Central Valley, California, we used to think seven years. Uh, every seven years, there's a cold weather, there's a this, and so you do your financials around that. Not anymore, it's literally every year. So the, the, think, the, the thinking process that I ask to change on farmers and on leaders is do it by the month and monitor every month your financials. And try to put away because it's going to happen faster than later and only so much you can go to the bank or only so much you can go to the government. But it's definitely changing 100%. And the, our, our, the other part that I'm getting concerned is how fast can we evolve on the new varieties kind of like the, we did with the vaccine, that we figure out the vaccine faster because this whole scientific world got in and figured it out. But obviously not on our seed world, on our fertilizer world, uh, maybe they are. But that's what they need to, they, they need to accelerate the process, whether and the financials will be there for us. But as uh, on the side of the farming side of it, you have to plan one, the same way with the seven years, you still do the seven years. And that was taught to me by a lot, lot of amazing leaders and mentors. You still do the seven years, but now you're fixing it. You're, you're monitoring every month, not every year. And that will adjust. And, and then look at the patterns. I, today I said it. Keep up with, uh, write the patterns. What happened this year? What happened that year? No longer is, I think last year it happened. No, you should have written what happened somewhere and keep track of it because it's going to come back and, and hit you again. Hey, Martha. Good morning. Welcome to Champagne. Good to see you, you. Uh, Jack, as well. Um, Martha, I, I completely got what you were talking about, about taste bud. Every year, at least we as a family go apple picking in the fall. Mm -hmm. Then for the rest of the year, it's very hard for me to eat apple. So, um, but we also know agricultural production tend to cluster because it really depends on the growing environment and the demand can be worldwide. There's a reason why those bananas, right, are going from Central America all the way to Russia. So my question is how do we balance, right, that preserve our taste bud fresh to make sure we actually, there's more people in the world can, can enjoy certain products? Um, my first recommendation is that um, it's going to take us like the brain, re-engineer our butts because we damage them literally, especially when you have the same food every single day of their life. Avo I'll give you an example on avocados. Avocados were seasonal uh, or the flavor of it, very delicious, very uh, juicy, very oily, very plummy. But the ones that we hear like a little thing, um, for me it has no taste. But that's what I eat now. For me, when I go now to the country of origin to eat an avocado like Dominican Republic, it takes me a little bit to ad adjust to the fact that that's the real original of an avocado, not an engineer avocado, okay? But then the second part of it is that we have to start consuming less of many things like salt and hot spices and stuff like that because that has changed our butts. And, and I don't say that, the, the scientists will tell you that that we have adjusted to just put a lot of things on it to get the flavor out of it. A flavor, but it's not the real flavor. Um, and last but not least, I'll tell you, I went to, we went to Paris for the World Cup soccer, for women World Cup soccer, and I had gone before, and I was shocked to see that it used to be, you go to France and you had little portions and little sp uh, things, I mean, portions and flavors. And all of a sudden, they were serving me these huge salads with this amount of dressings, huge portions, and I was shocked because that's not for me, France. France is petite, 
Um, and that's how every, the whole world has changed. We all have been changing our world to be big and no flavory and stuff like that. So it's going to take a little bit to readjust our bats and that will push back into production, believe it or not. We will push back like the gentlemen, the people are talking about quinoa. That quinoa is unique flavor in Indian tribes regions. And I'm telling you, you taste that quinoa versus a regular quinoa and you see that you taste the flavor immediately, but the original from the region. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Martha. Thank you.